Ngambi Kia Koto, welcome to this webinar on regenerative tourism today. I'm Alina Siegfried, and I'm the author and host of the Our Regenerative Future content series um, that's been produced in partnership with Pure Advantage and Edmund Hillary Fellowship. Um, over the past few months, we've been bringing uh, you the stories and ideas of those who are working at the forefront of developing regenerative models for New Zealand's economy in the future. Uh, we started out with a focus on rural regenerative agriculture, and we've now expanded this conversation into other areas, including forestry, uh, urban community agriculture, and tourism, which is the focus of today's session. Uh, through these conversations, we hope to spark some cross-sector dialogue, uh, recognizing that this process of regeneration isn't um, just up to the farmers that need to get on board. Um, and we'd love to get people thinking about systems level strategies for a regenerative and restorative economy for Aotearoa going forward. Today's panel features three fantastic leading thinkers in the area of sustainable and regenerative tourism. Uh, we have Dr. Suzanne Beckham is a professor of sustainable tourism and has served as a director of the Griffith Institute for Tourism at Griffith University in Queensland, Australia. She also serves as a principal science investment advisor for tourism in New Zealand's Department of Conservation and is on Air New Zealand's sustainability advisory panel. She's published over 100 articles on sustainable tourism, climate change and tourism resource use and is an elected fellow of the International Academy of the Study of Tourism. Uh, Larissa Kony of uh, Te Ate Haunui a Paparangi, Whanganui uh, Descent is the Chair of Tourism Bay of Plenty, which has adopted a regenerative tourism strategy. She has previously held roles with Deloitte in New Zealand and London, as a Director of the Charitable Investment Trust for Ngai Tai Kitamaki, and a Charter Member of the Institute of, Char um, of Directors. Her work in the regenerative space is inspired by the whakatauki from her iwi, ko o te awa, ko te awa ko o. I am the river and the river is me. And finally, Trent Yeo is executive director of ZipTrek Eco Tours in Queenstown, which he set up 10 years ago as an eco-tourism business that utilizes the power of adventure to help create meaningful memories of place. He's a current board member of Tourism Industry Aotearoa and is a retired TEDx organizer. So welcome uh, to the three of you today. It's fantastic to have you here on the panel. Um, I see we've got almost 80% voted on our poll. Um, looks like the majority of people or the largest sector is, um, is people who are aligned with, with tourism, which is fantastic given that that's today's discussion. But we've got a good balance of other people on the call from business, primary sector, government and academia as well. Um, and it looks like most people are calling in from uh, urban New Zealand today with about 23% in rural and almost 20% outside New Zealand. So a particular welcome, <laughs> no my hi my to you all. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Uh, just to let you know, you can submit questions to the panel through the Q&A box. Uh, which you can find down on the bottom bar on Zoom. And, um, and from there, we'll be asking our panelists a mix of prepared questions and, uh, and questions that you put through that box. Uh, we are recording this session today, and we're also streaming live on Facebook on the Edmund Hillary Fellowship page if you wanted to share with your friends today, or um, you could share the recording later on, which you'll be able to find on the Pure Advantage website and also on the Edmund Hillary Fellowship YouTube channel. Um, at this stage, I would love to ask our um, wonderful panelists to just briefly um, introduce themselves and, um, and, and perhaps um, weave into your answers. What, what does regenerative tourism mean to you? Uh, let's start with you, Larissa. I think you're on mute there. I'll just take you off. Is that good? There Kia we Elena. go. Uh, kia ora koutou, yeah. uh, ko Aotea Toku Waka, ko Rupei Toku Maunga, ko Whanganui Toku Awa, uh, ko Atiau Nui Paparangi Toku Iwi, uh, ko, uh, um, ko Larissa Kuni Ahau. Um, thank you, uh, it is a privilege to be here. Um, I might just, I've got a, I've got a couple of pre-prepared sort of um, thoughts here, but where I want to 
I guess, touch on with regenerative tourism is firstly on a key concept um, that I believe frames the whole regenerative um, approach. Um, and I think for us to truly understand what it means to um, for regenerative tourism, we need to understand the concept of uh, the ecosystem. Um, and that's moving away from a system that we used to know um, of more of an ecosystem where we are independent and uh, separate and <clears throat> largely do not inter um, impact each other when we think about our environment. So we're separate from our environment, we're separate from each other. And the only way to impact that is with physical force. So the ecosystem moves us more to a model where we see everything is um, interconnected um, and that everything in that ecosystem, our environment and the people and everything that's on planet Earth um, as a living being. Um, effectively, everything that exists has a vibration uh, that flows through it and can be easily transferred to um, other existing parts of that. Um, so I think it's really important that we do understand that key concept because it sort of frames the whole regenerative approach um, that to, to, um, to get the concept that our environment is a living being, we are living beings, and we not only impact each other through physical force, but through our energy um, frequency and body. So just a couple of points I just want to touch on there is uh, which further informs that because it is quite uh, a radical reframe or a different way of seeing our world. And you know some people have, have um, never observed it from that way and you've got others who have grown up and that's the way what they've known. But there's just two things I want to touch on here and that's ancient wisdom and, um, and quantum science which I think further help us inform um, this concept of the, the ecosystem. Um, so when you look at ancient wisdom, um, specifically here in New Zealand, our Māori culture acknowledges uh, our natural environment as living being. So you'll see that we name um, our earth pap Papatuanuku, Mother Papatuanuku, the sky Rangi, rangi Nui, and um, Tani Mahuta, our forest, and Tangaroa, our oceans. So there's a very clear connection in ancient wisdom that our natural environment is a living being. And then the second side of that is the, I just want to touch on the whakatauki um, that you talked about, Lena, earlier, ko o te awa, ko te awa, ko o. Um, which means it's a Māori proverb, um, it has a, it's a specific sort of archetype which has a whole body of knowledge underneath it that means I am the river and the river is me. Um, and when you come from that perspective, um, the well-being of our environment is a direct reflection of the well-being of the people and vice versa. If the people were doing well, our environment will do well. If our environment do, is doing well, then our people will, doing, will do well. So there's that um, knowledge that sits there um, in ancient wisdom that all existing things have a vibration that flows through it and can be easily transferred to other existing things. And then the second step, just to touch on there, is that quantum field, um, the science, the science behind it. There's, so, there's a whole wealth of new science there that is further informing ancient wisdom and this concept of the ecosystem and being living beings and the interdependence of it. Um, just to catch on a, touch on a couple, and I think this helps people really understand the core concept of it. Uh, Masiro Emoto, he was a Japanese uh, researcher who looked at, uh, researched um, the intelligence of water and proved that water is sensitive and it responds to what we say and the energy transfer with that. So when you send good energy to water and saying positive words to it, it formed the most beautiful crystals. His, war, his research also looked at prayers and intentions and in sending out energy um, and how that could change the quality of the water and improve it. There's a large number of um, studies he did that uh, where people went out and they put good intentions into polluted lakes and then they tested afterwards and the quality of it had improved. Um, and so there's, there's research there. You've got the quantum physics, which talks about the concept of entanglement and the Zerba effect, um, which shows that, you know, we're, we're only 1% physical and the, the rest of us is our energy body. So it can influence each other in the ecosystem. 
And uh, Lynn McCaddick, the intention lady, there's a whole heap of research there which shows that every thought has a tangible energy with the power to transform. Mm. Um, and that the universe is not a store house of static separate ob objects, but a single organism of inter in interconnected energy fields in a continuous state of becoming. So these, that's just a couple of examples that further inform that ecosystem approach. But um, what's important about it, bringing it back to tourism, bringing it back to tourism, is when we can have that true awareness um, that everything is interconnected, it's all alive, our environment with the people, then things get really exciting <laughs> in terms <laughs> of <laughs> how we view, you view life and, and what is possible. You know, and I think tourism can be a real um, advocate and it can be a vehicle for raising this level of consciousness. Um, and we're seeing a lot of research that's coming out now where the new tourist is asking for, you know, storytelling, cultural experiences, a transformation experience, connection with nature. So it's be, you know, if you can bring that wisdom through, um, through, through that space, then um, tourism takes on a, a whole, a whole new life. And then that also, there's a whole, there's, there's a much richer experience and exchange between the host and the visitor in our environment. So I'll leave it there because more that will come from that, but I just think it's a really core part of having a regenerative approach is to understand um, the, and, you know, the, the ecosystem approach and what drives it. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that, um, that uh, detailed and wonderful and, and earth-connecting um, introduction, Larissa. I'm, I'm looking forward to diving into a few of those concepts a bit more deeply. Um, let's just um, let introduce the rest of the panel. So, uh, Suzanne, if you'd like to uh, briefly introduce yourself. Yeah, thank, thank you. And, and thank you for having um, this event focusing on tourism. I think that's a great extension and so complementary to the discussions you've had on regenerative agriculture, because just like, like primary industries, tourism is heavily reliant on, on healthy environments, but also healthy community and people. And, and so I think um, Larissa set the scene. Um, I'm an ecologist. I did my university degree in ecology, so I'm, I'm very interested in ecosystem health, but, but I learned a lot about tourism and the interaction between people and the land and maybe just to sort of advance further what Larissa was saying and contrasting it a bit with sustainable tourism because we've we've got a very long tradition of sustainable tourism um, in fact in, in some parts world leading in New Zealand um, and people ask what's the difference between sustainable tourism and regenerative tourism is it the same thing it's obviously very related and and um, if we if we were all achieving you know well on the sustainable tourism front we would be a long way but the philosophy is a bit different in that regenerative tourism is more than just avoiding harm so i think in practice sustainable tourism has become a little bit an approach where quite isolated a business might focus on some technology solutions to address maybe carbon emissions or introduce recycling or this 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 maybe um, measures in terms of staff or so, but but it doesn't consider itself as as being an integral part of the destination, the system. It doesn't usually go beyond the borders of the particular company. And I think regenerative tourism thinks a lot more about um, actually giving back to the place where, where tourism operates. So not just the company, but but the local people. Um, whether it's regenerating ecosystems, contributing to thriving culture making sure community networks are built rather than eroded for tourism. And I think it became really clear in the last five years in New Zealand, but also globally as tourism has grown so much that the, the focus on just sustainable efficiency in some ways is not enough because any efficiency has been outweighed by growth. And so we, we need to move towards much, much more holistic um, thinking. And I think regenerative tourism offers that opportunity, especially in New Zealand. Fantastic. Thank you for that distinction, uh, Suzanne. And over to you, Trent. Kia ora koutou. Um, I consider myself a practitioner. Um, here in Queenstown, uh, we Zip Trek Eco Tours is a flying fox zipline tourism business. Um, the reason I'm in tourism is because it's a people game. And I believe that people are the gap that we have towards a better 
design future. I don't believe it's a technological or practical challenge. And this pandemic we've seen ourselves into shows that humanity can make massive changes in a short amount of time if it needs to. Um, what my, my background is um, actually architecture and we studied sustainability through architecture. Um, through architecture, you design um, a system and work with many people who are experts in their systems, uh, in their, their deeper part of the system. And from that, I realized and recognized that A, didn't necessarily need to do anything or build anything um, to affect people. Um, and once again, I'm people focused. And all I needed to do was to take people into the outdoors and get them to recognize, uh, live and breathe um, the inspiration that comes from our beautiful places. Um, and to build relationships with humans whilst doing so um, was vitally important. So that's, that's why I'm in the tourism game. In terms of like sustainability and uh, the concept of sustainability, which is often used, and now we're using the term regenerate, regenerative tourism, agriculture, and other things, is, yeah, I, I agree with Susanna. It's just kind of like, let's not think about doing less bad and think about doing more good. And, and it's really kind of simple. You need to do best, less bad to do more good. Um, but it's, it's, if you aim for the moon, you'll get to the top of the tree. And uh, that's kind of where I am right now. Thanks, uh, Trent. I love that framing of, of not just doing less bad, but actually doing good. Um, I'd love to ask you now, actually, what, um, what, what trends have you seen in New Zealand so far? Uh, what, what are you seeing on the ground as a tourism operator? I would say um, trends are hard to gather in short data points. <laughs> mm. um, I, guess, but, I guess my question is what trends were you seeing before COVID? Oh yeah, and, so we as a business were finding um, actually a, a, a slight decline in, in our business anyway. Um, some people, and once again, the world is not spread evenly. But, um, but then obviously significantly we went to a you know, zero business um, and what we've found in terms of trends coming out is that uh, domestic tourism is strong and can be strong, but it's very, very, very lumpy. Um, and that's not sustainable, um, I would say. And so concentrating and thinking about tourism in a very different way, um, not only new markets, but the changing habits of the old markets is really, really important. And considering so adding something of significant value to people. So in terms of trends, um, it was an interesting time. We came off a very high time uh, of the last 10 years. And actually that's the last time I, we opened that business in 2009 and we've only seen up. And so it's a very interesting time and it will sort out the, the, the good operators versus the others probably. All right, got it. And if anybody's wondering, that is a real background that is behind Trent right now. That's not a virtual background. Uh, he's actually in front of a window in those trees, which I think is pretty neat. I am not in a field of <laughs> sunflowers, <laughs> just to be completely transparent with you all. Um, uh, Dr. Susanna Beckin, I'm wondering if you um, have any further comments around wh how, what's the level of maturity of this field um, around the world, this concept of regenerative tourism? Is it, is it something that's reasonably new? It, I, I think it is new, actually, this idea of giving back. So not just cleaning up your own act, but really seeing yourself as, as the destination and having some responsibility beyond your business. Um, and we've always said you can't run a sustainable hotel if you are in an unsustainable destination because you need your partners, you need the infrastructure, you need to work together. So I think it's quite new. Um, I was going to comment on the question on trends as well, because I, I do actually think, even though we haven't really talked about regenerative tourism, KSE in New Zealand has been um, leading on quite a few fronts. And, and I know that uh, because last year I had the uh, privilege to judge the Tourism New Zealand 100% Pure Awards. And so I had to read for 70 applications of operators around the country. And I was actually really impressed. It was amazing. Most of these operators were involved in some form of predator control um, towards the, the predator free in um, 2050. They did um, a carbon sequestration. They, they sought to work with local EV and incorporate uh, tikanga Maori values. So I, I was actually quite impressed um, how much was going on. And even at the government level with the international visitor levy that was introduced, uh, $35 per, per visitor, which essentially is directed towards conservation products. Uh, project. So that's, in some ways, that is the start of regenerative tourism, that the visitors give back 
So, so I think um, we've got all the seats in the ground, so to speak, um, we need to scale it up, obviously, understand a bit better what it truly means. And in that sense, I can see New Zealand being a world leader in this space. Absolutely. I think that that's key is, is to scale. Um, it's great to see organisations like um, Bay of Plenty Tourism um, taking on a regenerative strategy. Larissa, can you tell us a little bit about um, how that came about? Sure, thanks. Um, so Tourism Bay of Plenty engaged an organisation called Destination Think um, to help us co-design a plan for our regenerative tourism approach in the coastal Bay of Plenty um, with our long-term outcome to show that tourism can be a regenerative force that enables all of life to, to thrive. Um, a place that not only sustains life, but fosters new life in a constantly regenerating environment. Um, so our perspective on regenerative tourism is, it's all about leaving our place and our people better than we found them. So coming back to what Suzanne and Trent talked about, it, it's that, you know, the difference between sustainable and regeneration, you're going that extra step. So we did, we've adopted a regenerative strategy. We've gone through a number of uh, steps with that. We started, purposely started our journey by wanting to understand what was our uh, DNA uh, of the Coastal Bay of Plenty. And we used the word DNA because we wanted to illustrate the fact that our place is a living system, bringing it back to that concept of the ecosystem. So that was purposeful. Um, and then we continued to use all of the, the common principles that are part of the regenerative ecosystem of uh, Kotahitanga, um, Manakitanga, Kaititanga. Um, we wanted to embed all of that right through. So we did the strategy collaboratively. We went out to the community and we got every, we, we asked for feedback and we, we built it from there. Um, and it's, it, cause what we've found is it's really, really important when you acknowledge this ecosystem and regenerative approach that you can't do it on our own. It's gonna take the whole community to get in on this. It takes local council, you know, and you want them to buy into the, the approach. Um, your business leaders, chambers, um, your iwi group, and it's really bringing all of the key players in your community together um, to buy into this concept to move forward. Uh, because it's going to, you know, it's about ensuring our infrastructure is right for our tourism numbers. It's ensuring resident satisfaction, so residents are on board and that, you know, and they're part of this approach. And it does. You want to ensure that we're not eroding our natural resources. Um, and the storytelling element, and, and as I talked about earlier, being able to bring that to life um, through cultural experiences, and, and we have this, um, is, is paramount as well for people really getting this concept that we are part of our environment, our environment is a part of us, and you know, you can heal, you can heal together. So we, we went on that journey. Um, we, we developed a storytelling framework with resident input, um, We've developed uh, the next step. We developed uh, integrated destination management plan and development plan, which aims to bring visitors into harmony um, with our larger identity that is here. And then we looked at what are the the niche groups um, for our bay. You know, what are those niche groups that allow us to con stay connected with our environment and ensure that everyone flourishes? And we came up with four key niche groups there outdoor adventures, cultural explorers, explorers, surf and beach lovers, and the, the eco-travellers. Um, and so we've done that with the support. We have reached out to pioneers in the space. So Anna Pollock, who's from the UK, pioneer of the Conscious Traveller, has been um, very supportive and um, has helped us move forward in the space. Um, back to, I think it was Suzanne's comment, um, she sees New Zealand as being a visionary country here to really lead a strong regenerative uh, tourism approach. Um, and so we feel very grateful that we have the support of Anna and um, also Destination Think and, and, and other bodies who are helping us on this journey because it is quite a new concept. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you touched on your introduction around bringing some of the concepts of um, Matauranga Māori into some of your planning. Have you got any um, uh, tips or advice for other regions in New Zealand that might be wanting to take more of that approach and, and how you were able to bring that into, you know, a, an organisation that, that functions as a, with a lot of different stakeholders and um, 
yeah any thoughts there yeah <clears throat> a really good question actually um because what we found quite early it was important to have a strong relationship with uh iwi and um and so this uh, what we did quite early in our experience is in, to, in order to connect with maori cultural values um, we engaged a role and we purposely invested in a role in our organization called um, our kaihotu um, and that's a, a Māori um, uh, economy role. So that's someone who's come in to really help us um, uh, reach out and um, have a true authentic relationship with iwi. Um, we are, it's, you know, it goes both ways and both can benefit and um, we go on the journey together. So, and, and that has, that, that, that's helped. So I would recommend having um, the, the intel and the experience within the organization to help with that. And a genuine commitment um, that we're in this for a long-term game. You know, you want your values to be aligned because I think with any partnership or relationship, um, people want to see that the values are consistent and, and that we're going to walk that and we're in this journey together for the long-term. Mm, thank you. Fantastic. And just um, to ask quickly, there's a question for you, Larissa, in the in the chat, um, just to reiterate the name of that water study that you mentioned before. Okay, so um, the the um, pioneer, I guess, in that, or the internationally around Japanese re research, it was Masiro Himoto. So this is his, um, the true, can you see that? Uh, so yeah, yep. Yeah. So that's one the true of power books. of water. Yeah. yeah, but if you Google Masiroi Moto, um, there's a lot there, um, and he's got several books which um, cover the research. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we're obviously facing a really interesting time in New Zealand and a very challenging time for tourism operators as we reassess what, what the future is going to look like um, and our borders being closed for a long time. And so I think there's a lot to happen there that needs to... Um, there's a lot that needs to happen rather around looking at the the value of tourism and, and, the, and our mindset around um, how how the intricacies of work, work in New Zealand. Um, Suzanne, I wonder if you could comment on um, on ways that perhaps we might stop looking at the total number of tourists and look at, at the contribution and value that those tourists are, are bringing, yeah, both thank domestic you. And, and, and eventually international. Yeah, yeah, and I did notice a few questions as well on that and in relation to volumes and, and borders and so on. So I think Larissa made a good case for how you approached it in the Bay of Plenty and really also thinking about what do we want from tourism and what kind of visitor types would fit our destination makeup and aspirations. And I think I think we need to do the same thinking for New Zealand. What, what do we actually want and what does value mean? In value, of course, has an economic component in terms of expenditure, but it is more, it's about resilient markets. And this is where, for example, Australia is just so important and um, might not be the highest spenders, but they're close, they have a low carbon footprint. Um, so for example, an Australian visitor who comes to New Zealand produces about half a ton of carbon dioxide for the air travel and a European visitor produces five times as much, three tons. And so we have to think about, okay, long term, is this actually a liability? Is it a risk? Uh, should we? So, so, so value for tourism has multiple components and it's about um, what do people contribute to the local culture and environment and so on. So thinking a little bit about, about that. So it's not just about the numbers, but it's what we get out of it and less might be more. Just a brief comment on domestic tourism, because obviously that's all we have in the moment. And and to be honest, looking at some other countries in the world, we're really lucky we have a domestic market. I just saw numbers from Thailand, where tourism is 20% of GDP, mainly international people are absolutely bleeding. So, mm. so we are lucky. And I think maybe what comes out of this is that we appreciate the domestic market more. Again, that we develop high value products for the domestic traveler. I'm thinking for example, about food tourism, local culinary trials, and um, where we can really add multiple values together. Every tour, every New Zealander who does not leave the country, but holidays in New Zealand also does not produce a carbon footprint because we Kiwis, um, 3.1 million fly overseas every year. So, so you've got a double whammy if, if, we, if we travel here. So, so the question is, how sustainable is that long-term in terms of commercial value and trend? I'm sure you've got some thoughts on that. Um, what other markets can we capture that are low carbon, high value? 
maybe student international markets that already make a big chunk of international arrivals, maybe we can extract more value there. So, so I think that's the kind of shift in thinking that it's not just bumps on seats, but actually who, who comes here, what do they do and how do they contribute? Yeah, absolutely. And we'll come to you in a moment, Trent. Um, I just want to um, come back to you, Suzanne, with any thoughts around uh, how we might uh, get people to spend more, more time in a one particular place rather than jumping from place to place and ticking things off their bucket list and, you know, just um, traveling very quickly, but rather actually staying in one yeah. place. I mean, it's, it's quite a mindset shift in terms of how we do tourism, but are there Absolutely. any um, places around the world that, that do that well? Um, I mean, it's this whole shift towards slow travel. And, and first, it starts, of course, with the types of people who even get to New Zealand and what they're driven by genuine meaningful deep experiences in connecting with a place or just ticking off Instagram icons. So, so that's one thing. And then on the practical level, and I'm sure again, Trent has some ideas and then Larissa, but there are of course already good examples where, for example, in Oamaru, the penguin colony, um, it's quite handy. It's a night, it's an evening attraction, which then helps quite purposefully people to stay in town the night and then you have dinner and spend money on accommodation. So designing experiences in a way that keep people longer, making it attractive to explore local attractions rather than just sipping, um, essentially driving for New Zealand. Um, I think that's that's the key. And, and I think, to be honest, this current experience will really trigger some innovation and in entrepreneurship um, to offer exactly that slower travel for people. You know, cycle trails are a wonderful example as well, where people go slowly and really take in what the, the local place has to offer. Yeah, thank you. Um, Trent, I'm wondering if, um, you know, given that you've spent 10 years in the sector, what sort of opportunities do you see for integrated um, models of regenerative tourism that, that might include uh, restorative practices, perhaps in farming or forestry or uh, food and beverage, as Suzanne did mention, and um, looking at the things not so much in a siloed point of view, but how can, you know, how could tourists help uh, plant trees on our on our farms or restore wetlands or anything like that so yeah i think i totally agree with um a very deeper broader view of what a tourist value is um and i think that um there's many ways in which to interact um companies employ people and create economic value but there's much more than that i believe that any product that new zealand does really well could be sold through tourism and tourism experiences. I was literally talking to a drinks manufacturer who does an amazing, they have a sustainable tourism business, Cheer Sisters. And I was asking them about, have they looked into tourism opportunities um, in which to uh, learn about how another, another organization has transformed or, or focused itself on creating a sustainable model or a regenerative model. Um, and I think it's not easy for everybody, but you think about every piece of, agricultural land in New Zealand. It's spectacular by definition. Um, there's so much amazing stuff to see um, and experiences to get deeply into. Um, the storytelling and camaraderie which can be built through people to people connection is also extremely important. And then in terms of future trade, and that's with an international and a Kiwi traveler is I remember that farm, I'd like to buy my eggs from there because I believe in Joe, they do a really good job. So there's sort of like the, the soft perspective of interaction. Then there's hard interactions like I'm, I'm totally gonna, I, I'll support Joe's egg farm, not a good example, um, and then buy the egg products from him and, and tell my family that it's a good place, right? So there's lots of, um, uh, accelerator or, or multiplier effects which can come through experience and that's why I'm once again in the game of experience because tourism is memory making and mm. memory making is um, a match between an experience and an emotion once we can have an emotional response to something it gives us the best chance to absorb that experience and to anchor it in place and so for me, it's one of the greatest opportunities to build that relationship. And in this context, and I think that domestic tourism is so important to talk about, is we have to build repeated visitors slash uh, advocates for our place. 
Because if you think that all of the tourism that was going overseas is staying here, we're only going to survive if we can have repeat visitation from those same people and or their families, friends and associates. So we have to produce a, a, a value proposition that is so high that I would like to come back again and or is changeable. So therefore I'm constantly getting new information that keeps me excited. But if we have designed a whole system for unique visitation, which is the biggest challenge and it's something that we face every day. If you've designed it for unique visitation, your model may not exist in the future. Right, yeah. Some interesting points there about creating that connection to place and, and having people come back. And I guess with a lot of these conversations, we, when we're talking about regenerative tourism, I think probably most people's uh, first association would be to the environment. But there's certainly a social element here too. Um, Larissa, maybe you could speak a little bit to the, the social elements of regenerative tourism from your point of view. Sure. Um, so just a, a couple of points there, and it probably comes back to my opening comment that it's not just about leaving our land better than we found it, but it's that commitment to leave our people better than we found them. Um, so each tourism encounter with the, the visitor and the host you know, if I've got that intention and that deep awareness that we're all connected in this one ecosystem and if you're doing well, then I'm going to do well and we're all going to flourish and, and, and be very, very happy and, um, you know, and healthy people, then um, the experience is quite different when people come from that, that, that really grounded intention experience and that for the visitor as well. You know, the visitor coming in knowing I want to give back and I want to leave this place better then I found I want this place to be better for my visit for me visiting, um, and that could be um, a monetary exchange, you know. So um, paying, being happy to pay more for that experience because they see that connection and they can see how it's giving back to that community, um, or it could be an energetic, you know, exchange where I talked about earlier in terms of our frequency, in terms of prayer and karaoke and, and going on that journey, um, touching on what Trent said, and it could be going back and, and sharing word of mouth. Um, you know, we found it to be one of our most, um, one of our most efficient forms of marketing here. Um, so there's, you know, there's that whole social element. There's, of course, the element of I know a number of iwi groups that I work with will purposely go into tourism, but because um, it generates jobs for their people, um, and and it ensures that there's work. And I know a number of them who are students who, um, you know, whenever they do their tourist attraction, they will stand up and they will thank the visitor because their contribution has helped them get the education, and so they are therefore leaving that person better. You know, and people want that, you know, the research that has come out that people want to be contributing when they are out being a visitor. They, um, they want to um, have a transformative um, experience um, and, and they want to learn. They want to learn more. So, the, you know, there's, if we take it from that perspective that regenerative tourism is not just about our environment, but it's leaving our people better, then that whole ecosystem benefits. And, and effectively coming back to the ecosystem, if one's not doing well, then the other's not doing well. So we want all of it to flourish. Yeah, fantastic. Um, there's a great question here from um, Amanda Hunt in the Q&A box around um, climate change and, and uh, the, the future of air travel. Um, and I guess, I guess it's a difficult question for New Zealand to face, but what, what is the future of international tourism realistically? Um, at the moment, a lot of people are um, in tourism are just perhaps pressing that pause button and waiting for uh, business as usual to return once, once COVID is, is in the clear. Um, Trent, do you think we might need to be realistic and start really rethinking our tourism strategy? And it, it might actually, dare I say, it require a, a permanent downsizing of the industry for New Zealand. Yeah, so I think that's a really interesting point. I think that, um, I mean, I know that Tourism New Zealand has completely changed the way in which they're doing everything. They've created a whole domestic team. They've never had the mandate to really do that. And they're completely flipped everything on that. Um, they're putting resources into getting people out there. Um, I believe that there's, we sort of have the ultimate op opportunity to rethink how we deliver tourism in our focuses. Um, and I would love to see 
everyone really get on board uh, creating um, a whole ecosystem around focused on a domestic traveler. The thing about the domestic traveler, the, tra uh, the Kiwi traveler is we don't actually have that much data about them. So that's also being done. Um, and that's um, for the first time really. Um, and so once we can understand uh, habits and interests, I think that will help us to be able to uh, make those changes because there's significant changes in an ecosystem. They're not just like minor changes. For some people's business, 100% of their business was based on international travel. Um, so we have to have uh, a lot of focus on this and encouragement of each other to do this. It is vitally important. Um, and I sort of have used the analogy before of uh, if, and it's a bad analogy and a, maybe a good one, is that um, if New Zealand was a sport, a rugby team, um, you would probably say to them, you'd probably say to them, you have a lot of talent. You have talent oozing out your pores, but you need discipline. You need focus. You need structure. And this is their ultimate chance to say, hey, man, like, you, we have everything we want, we need to have a thriving internal uh, tourism economy, uh, which celebrates all of the positive contributions that tourism has, not just employment, storytelling, um, uh, potential for learning and contributing to environmental aims, etc. There's so many good aspects of tourism. We have to focus on every one of them and rebuild it in a very different way. And I know it is really hard for some people. It is really hard for us. I'm not saying it's easy, but we actually don't have a choice and it happens to align with, it's the best thing we can do anyway. So there's no reason not to do any of those things. Like we, you very rarely have that sort of alignment. You need to do this and you have to do this. So let's get on with doing it. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I like your analogy there, you know, if you want to get Kiwis on board with something, use a rugby analogy. <laughs> um, but I'd, um, I'd love to just, um, yeah, unpack that a little further with, with you, Trent. What, how much do you think this needs to be driven by individual tourism operators, you know, that are they're really leaning in with on-the-ground solutions? And how much do you think it really needs to be something that's driven by policy or, or um, from above? Okay, so maybe obvious statement, both are very, very important. I believe that people have been leaning very heavily on our government to come up with all the solutions. Um, I believe that collaboration is the only way in which we're going to do it um, in a meaningful and significant manner. So it's not up to one organisation, one business to do it. Um, but relying on others to do it is also not an option. So that's a very sort of middle of the road answer on all of those things. But what I would say, my analogy to this scenario is we stop the bleeding but no one's working on patient management and I believe the reason I'm in business and not education and not architecture and not other planning and other things that I was very interested in is because I believe that business can be agile I believe that business can make a choice very quickly I have not seen the type of leadership out of this that I'd like to see and I'm not saying I have all the solutions I'm saying I would like to see other people um, dig really deep into this and start to really think about what the recreation of a better tourism ecosystem looks like. Got it. Got it. Um, we've seen recently um, with um, MPI, Ministry of Primary Industries, bringing together um, quite a few uh, different agriculture groups um, with, under their Tataio banner. Um, to look at regenerative agriculture as, as one potential solution. Um, Larissa, do you see something similar like that happening perhaps uh, with tourism? Uh, <clears throat> I might throw this one over to Suzanne too because she's probably going to have more <laughs> insight on that. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think there's an opportunity here to you know, build a framework um, that everyone buys into with the core principles. Um, that that um, that guide us on that. So um, we're starting. I know Suzanne and I and Anna and Kristen, our CEO, we've had discussions quite early in the piece with this. Actually, um, I think it was during the COVID lockdown about how we do create a movement here. 
and how we get the right people at the right table to, to move this further. Um, I know uh, Tourism Bay of Kenny, we've put a stake in the ground and this is our strategy, we're doing it. Um, and, uh, but it would be good as a nation that we have the right people at the table to come on this journey. Um, and then sometimes you see there's always the people who, who go ahead and then people are watching and then they can see the benefit and they will come on. Um, but we do, I know Susanna's there with us on the other assist, Anna and Chris would like this to be a bigger movement for New Zealand. Got it. Uh, Suzanne, yeah, have you got any additional thoughts there or perhaps um, pointing to any situations overseas where you've seen a lot of diverse tourism groups coming together under a central strategy? Uh, well, that's uh, it's always a question who does it best in the world. Um, maybe just in the New Zealand context, we are starting a future tourism task force, um, which will be a mix of industry and government and they will have an advisory group, um, a wider one that can really connect into the different subgroups of the sector. So that's a really good start. Uh, we've got a tourism strategy which provides also a good start, doesn't quite go far enough, but definitely has the, the core where we can then add the depth of regenerative tourism and, and the, the thinking that comes with it. I think I think there's still work to be done in terms of some of the key questions and, and, and it is good the audience is, is really on it with the questions. Uh, I mean the international air travel is one. To what extent do we need it, want it, you know, it is a bit like the fertilizer and agriculture. How much do we want to rely on that? Um, is, that a, is that a good thing? So, so there's some key questions around the values. What do we want? I think once we have that common song sheet, then I think industry does what industry does best. And that's in, in we've got some amazing innovative entrepreneurs to really push the boundary and for government policy to make sure that the general standard is lifted. So I would like us to see some more Things like, for example, uh, Norway um, has declared that from 2026, um, the fjords, the cruise ships in the fjords are zero emissions. If, if a ship doesn't comply, they can't come. So there's some legislation that really eliminates some things that are bad practice. So bringing that up, having maybe a mandatory carbon reporting for tourism in New Zealand would be great. Having support programs around um, research and innovation to, to drive some of that new thinking integrated at the place. So I think, I think the everyone has to work on this together um, around a common vision. That's an interesting point about the, the zero emissions cruise ships. And there's a question here from Trevor Richards in the Q&A who points out that New Zealand was discovered on the wind and is a, somewhat of a sailing destination. Um, do you think there's opportunities for the cruise industry to be constructed to wind uh, travel? Imagine those would be some pretty hefty sails. Um, but uh, how could New Zealand perhaps lead the, the world in, in sustainable ship design for, for uh, bringing tourists over? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the cruise ship the industry is obviously a big item and, and something that we really have to look at very, very carefully in the moment. That's highly unsustainable, let alone not regenerative. But um, Japan, for example, is doing some research into renewable cruise ships and they are sort of plastered with solar panels and they have sails and all of that. So it, I'm not saying it won't happen. I think just like in aviation where we need to invest heavily into alternative fuels for the long term, because otherwise we will be a very remote island in the future. So we need that. Um, and I do like the idea of, of cruise ships that run on renewable idea, uh, energy. They will not have 5,000 people on them. It will be smaller scale. Um, and that could be a good thing because communities are not overrun by people then it could be a better balance but it it brings it again back to the question should we try then having less volume but do that really well maybe charge more for it get more value out of it and then be able to actually for example fuel it with renewable energy and that goes for cruise ships just like for airplanes okay got it there's another question I'd love to put you to you quickly here from Matty Wall. Matty Wall. Um, is, uh, is there anything that New Zealand can learn from Bhutan as a potential model for our, our new look tourism industry? I mean, the good thing about the Bhutan policy is that essentially, well, it charges people a fair price because it's a highly exclusive uh, product. Um, there's counter uh, arguments to that as well. It, it makes people um, stay for a minimum length of time. And it actually then gives a discount um, to that daily tax that you have to pay, essentially, if you stay longer, like I think it's longer than 14 days, it, it progressively gets less, which is a really good idea. So I think that's good. On the other hand, 
of course, I don't think we're quite as, uh, it's, it's in some ways quite uh, top-down autocratic and, and what I would like to see for New Zealand is much more of a bottom-up approach where actually destinations and communities are empowered to, to decide what they want, a bit like um, Larissa has, has painted a picture for the Bay of Plenty. Uh, rather than just government saying, okay, this is how much we want, and this is how, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's a mix. There's some good, interesting elements from Bhutan, but probably not quite the approach that works for New Zealand. Okay, got it. Thank you for those insights. Um, Larissa, I'd love to put to you a question, um, again, from the Q&A box here, um, around Bay of Plenty potentially utilising the relationship possibilities offered uh, via Airbnb in new ways. So thinking really in, in quite creative ways, um, could, could Airbnb be hosting farmers that are needed for perhaps or, or seasonal migrant workers to be picking the kiwi fruit that we've, we've got in the, in the Bay of Plenty? Or, um, is, there, is there other sort of other sports, um, sorts of ways that we can um, be using that potential of those empty houses or empty rooms? Yes, and um, good question. I believe we're doing some of that already in the Bay. Um, and Airbnb, from my understanding, was quite quick to pivot um, when uh, we, we hit COVID and um, some of them went back into rental or they were looking at alternative um, use for accommodation. Um, and what was really neat to see in the community here is uh, the external agencies came together quite fast and put their thinking caps on and, and went back out and say, is this something that will work? Can we move people from here to here? You know, just like with the jobs, you know, when the tourism industry, okay, you're letting go of staff here, you don't need them at the moment, can we get them to Kiwi Fruit? So mm -hmm. that happened quite swiftly here. So I do admire the region for what they did there. And um, that's the same opportunity with um, Airbnb and, and, and um, accommodation that, um, they use the word pivot, but people just putting on their thinking cap and thinking, well, what do we do in this transition period versus what may be our new norm as well um, for the future? And how, how can the community support that? Mm. Okay, wonderful. Um, hey, I've got one quick question for Trent, and then we're going to go to a final question for the whole panel. Um, Trent, what do you think, this is a bit of a left field one, what do you think about the role of technology in the future in tourism? I mean, if this, this COVID thing really drags out, could we start seeing something like VR or AR supported tourism experiences that don't require feet on the actual literal ground? Uh, my view is, uh, from a practical view, I think that augmented reality has a deeper opportunity than virtual reality. Um, I think that virtual reality has pre and post experience possibilities. Um, my view on augmented is absolutely, I think that it can um, create uh, a deeper or different type of storytelling. Will it take over tourism and tourism experiences? I don't think so. I think it will just supplement what we currently have. And I'm myself a very keen traveller. And, you know, you can judge me like on that if you like. But um, I, I think that the, the chance to go to a place which is quite different um, and has a culturally different um, view and you're a minority and all that sort of stuff is, is something that I, I want to hold on to. That's why I want to be doing tourism um, and we need to be able to do it better. In terms of technology, uh, I think that it has a supplementary piece only for this. Yeah, yeah, got it. There is nothing quite like the first hand experience. Um, we are coming up towards the top of the hour shortly, so I'd like to put one final question to the panel. Um, and it's the question that came through from Sam Bro. Um, if you had to profile the socially and environmentally conscious tourist of the future that New Zealand wants to see, how would you describe? that person or I'd like to um, ask you each that question. Um, let's start with you, Trent. And let's keep the answers pretty short, say 30 seconds. Um, I would like to have a tourist who considered what they could do to contribute to the place that they visited. Nice, succinct, <laughs> love it. <laughs> Uh, Suzanne, what, what would you like to see in that tourist? Um, I think the word mindful comes to mind. Um, people are mindful of what they do, where they are and who they interact with and uh, consider it and, and seek to give back and not just take. 
Mm. Mindful is a very good word indeed. Mm. Uh, Larissa, what would that, that Taurus look like to you? Um, a line that is definitely along the same lines as what Chunt and Suzanne have said. Um, a more consciously aware uh, tourist who's um, aware of, you know, the ancient wisdom, the new science in terms of, and really buys into this ecosystem approach. Um, and I think if we've got that perspective and, you know, you're walking with that in your, as the new way of seeing the world, you will show up naturally and treat the environment differently, have different um, interactions with other people. And generally, from that place, want to give back um, because you see that there's a higher purpose with all of this. Yes, absolutely. And I think as, um, as Trent put earlier on, is to have people developing relationships with, with place so that they become repeat tourists and they're actually um, developing an ongoing give and take connection um, with, with the places that they're visiting and the communities, of course, as well. Um, hey, fantastic to have you all. Thank you so much for giving your time so generously today to chat with us about regenerative Tourism, it's been a um, really exciting conversation. I'm sorry we haven't got a chance to get to everybody's questions. Um, Pure Advantage will be answering some of those questions on their social media in the coming weeks and, and uh, continuing this conversation about regeneration. Um, we have one final episode left in this Our Regenerative Future series, and that is next Monday evening. Um, it is the Toward a Regenerative Economy for Aotearoa New Zealand episode. Um, and we're going to be inviting some of our past panellists uh, back for a, a final discussion. It's a 90-minute special, so we'll have a little more space in that one. Uh, but we're, we're very, very fortunate to have um, Dame Anne and Sammons joining us again for that discussion, along with business journalist Rod Oram, um, Mike Taitoko, who is um, from, from Toha Foundry, helping with uh, investing and supporting regenerative projects. Um, and also uh, Hamish Bielski, who is a, a regenerative sheep and beef farmer from down in Otago and has been doing some amazing things. So that's going to be a really exciting uh, session, really talking about integrated solutions and looking at how we can uh, put systems change at the centre of a regenerative uh, economy strategy for New Zealand going forward. Thank you again so much for joining us today. Um, it's been wonderful to have everybody on the call and we will see you next week. Ka kite anō. Ka kite.